I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast, part of the 90 Min Football Network as ever. I'm your host, Harry Simiou, and on this edition of the show, I'm going to be sharing with you guys my five reasons that I think Arsenal fans should continue to trust in the process, should continue to trust in the job that both Mikel Arteta and Edu are doing at the football club currently. I think we are moving in the right direction. I think there's been a lot of frustration over the last few years at certain moments. And rightfully so, you know, we're football fans, we're Arsenal fans, and ultimately we all want this team to be as successful as it possibly can be. And I think we can all agree that there have been moments where questionable decisions have been made. I think we can all agree that there have been moments when... um, We'd have perhaps done things differently, probably in hindsight should have done things differently. Um, You know, missed very, very big and good opportunities to potentially accelerate the process, i.e., you know, as much as people want to say that actually maybe missing out on Champions League football was a blessing in disguise because we weren't ready for it. I don't really buy into that. I actually think it would have accelerated uh, the process, if you like. And I know that in the club's view and in particular Edu's view, which he kind of shared with us all in that interview that was released earlier this week, Arsenal would have been ahead of schedule had they achieved that in comparison to the plans that have been laid out by him and Mikel Arteta. But for me, there was disappointment at the back end of last season. There's there's no getting away from that. It was frustrating because a real opportunity presented itself. But unfortunately, we weren't ready to take that opportunity. And that's that's important as well, that when opportunities come along, you're ready to take them. It isn't just, oh, well, you know, Manchester United were below par and, uh, you know, Tottenham were where they were and had to sack a manager last season. So how was it that they got above us? Ultimately, they were good enough in the key moments with the right players, with the key players, with the experience of the, the elite manager that they have at their football club. They were able to get over the line and make that happen, whereas we just fell a little bit short. So, yeah, look, is what it is. It's 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 the past now. There's no point in crying over spilt milk. But I always said at the back end of last season that when the dust settled, we'd probably look at things slightly differently. We'd probably be able to look at things with a much calmer head and make sense of what we saw last season. And the reality is that for the most part, there was improvement. I mean, two eighth place finishes uh, was obviously disappointing for a club of our size and of our stature. But to then follow that up with a fifth place finish undoubtedly signifies progress. And I always have this debate with people, you know, they always say, well, Arsenal finishing fifth could have been a bit of a red herring because of the fact that, you know, Manchester United weren't very good and uh, the problems that Tottenham had and that, you know, Chelsea weren't as formidable as they were thought to be going into that campaign. Obviously, they ended up finishing above anyway. But the point I'm trying to make here is that Sometimes you can read too much into things, but the reality is if you just look at it on face value, Arsenal finishing in fifth after back-to-back eighth place finishes is absolutely progress. Like it, 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 it is what it is. It is progress. Um, and I don't think we should sort of beat ourselves up too much about that and, and try and nitpick into the areas as to why that might happen. Because going into the new season, for example, You know, you might think that Chelsea are going to be much stronger than us. You might think that Spurs are going to be much stronger than us. And often it's not always the way it works out. Often there will be a couple of teams that underperform in comparison to what people thought they were capable of achieving. Often there will be things that unfold over the course of the season, fallings out, disputes, um, disharmony in dressing rooms that can impact teams. And I think that one of the big things that Arsenal have in their favour right now over Spurs, for example, is stability. I think that what Spurs have done is has been very good under Antonio Conte. They've managed to turn things around really, really quickly. And I was having a great debate this morning on WhatsApp over voice note with my uh, my good friend Dan DeLuca, who who was on the podcast quite a bit in the past and and will be coming on next week to have this very, very debate uh, with me. But we were talking about kind of the differences between the two projects. And I don't want to spoil it. Um, I don't want to spoil the podcast coming up by giving too much away. But ultimately, and fundamentally, my view is that what Spurs are doing is built on a much shakier foundation 
than what Arsenal are doing. So, yeah, it might breed short-term success in that they need to win a trophy desperately and they might well achieve that under Antonio Conte. But will it put them in a position from where they can be sustainably successful? That's the big question mark I have around the approach that Tottenham have taken. So Arsenal have that stability and I think that is an undervalued commodity in the modern game. And I think it's something that we can really, really benefit from. But I've put down five reasons why I think that Arsenal fans need to and should give Mikel Arteta and Edu a bit more time and at least this season uh, to, to show us further progress and further convince us that we are moving in the right direction. I wrote a piece on this for 90min.com, which if you're watching on YouTube, you'll be able to see on your screens how unprofessional of me. Um, a Sky News notification slap bang in the middle of the program. Terrible on my part. Uh, but look, let's go through this piece and, and I'll share with you guys the five reasons. Now, I did tweet this piece out. Some of you would have read it, but I just wanted to add a little bit more context to some of the points made and share it with those of you that haven't read it, of course. Um, so here was my piece titled Five Reasons Why Arsenal Fans Should Trust Mikel Arteta and Edu. I'm not going to go through the spiel at the beginning, which just provides a little bit of context as to uh, Edu, his role and the fact that he sat down and gave this interview to uh, various outlets during the summer tour. But my first point, and I think the, probably the most important one is there is a clear plan. Now, I say despite the panic that ensued after the Gunners' worrying start to the 2021-22 season, those within the walls of the club's London Colony training facility remained calm, with Edu publicly calling on the fans to be patient and reserve their judgment on the side until they had something close to their best 11 available and a huge upturn in results was to follow. You've all seen that clip going around on Twitter, on social media from the Amazon doc, where Mikel Arteta gives an explanation about his uh, heart condition when he was a kid and talks about how, you know, high performance can be in, in all different facets of life. And, and then that, you know, off the back of that, Arsenal go out and pick up some much better results. Um, so I say, whether you agree or disagree with Arsenal's methods, it's clear that they're sticking to a blueprint that was created in collaboration between the manager and his technical director. Even when there's a temptation to veer away from it, i.e. last January, when there was a temptation to go, no, we have an opportunity, we have to take it, and we're so desperate to take it that we're going to go and veer away from our recruitment plan, veer away from what we mapped out in order to try and capitalise on that opportunity and then potentially being stuck with something that didn't necessarily make sense, potentially tying one hand behind your back going into the summer transfer window because of what you spent in January. Arsenal have shown, Arteta and Edu have shown, that they're not willing to do that. They remain confident in their original plan and they need to stick to it if they're to steer this juggernaut of a football club back on course. I think that's key. The second point I made was with regards to the development of a clear playing style. Now, we had a playing style under Arsene Wenger. It changed over the years, as you'd expect it to, over the course of a 22-year tenure. But ultimately, it was built on players being allowed to go out and express themselves, players being allowed to play free-flowing, attacking football. That was the, the top line of, of Arsene Wenger's philosophy, of Arsene Wenger's uh, ideology. And, you know, it became out of date, you know, very, very quickly. He he changed it up when he went from kind of having the physical powerhouses that, that we had with Vieira, Gilberto, uh, all of those guys. And then went, you know, Sol Campbell, Colo Touré. And then he went to, let's try and replicate the Barcelona model. And unfortunately for us, you know, the truth is, it didn't really work. You know, Arsenal um, were more competitive than they are today or, or have been in the last few years uh, in terms of league finishes, etc., and, and got into the Champions League more often than not. But we still weren't right at the top table. And that was largely due to lack of investment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But one of the points that Edu made in that interview that really kind of struck a chord with me in a good way, if that can be said in a good way, um, was was when he kind of went back and highlighted why he was somebody leading the the case to essentially sack Unai Emery and move him on. He talked about a lack of playing style. He talked about the fact that it was really difficult for the club to identify 
and help Unai Emery identify players that would come in and, and make a difference because they didn't quite understand exactly what he wanted. They didn't quite understand the direction in which he was taking the club. Now, again, this is not having a go at the fact that Unai Emery's English was very limited or anything like that. But clearly those people within the walls of Arsenal could not see what Unai Emery was trying to do. You know, there were times we played with a back five. There were times we played with a back four. And I know Mikel Arteta at times has changed and changed the formation. But you can now see, particularly after last season, that there are, as he would call them, non-negotiables. There are things, principles that will be required and demanded in every game, regardless of the formation, regardless of the personnel. So a clear playing style has become apparent and that has helped Arsenal in being able to go out and recruit better. It's not always been clear to see and the truth is it took an awful lot of recruitment to get there. But our Teta ball is finally here. The high intensity game with an emphasis on an aggressive pressing style has seen the Gunners control far more football matches. Mobility and versatility are two of the key attributes Arteta values most. And that's apparent when you assess the summer signings the club have made so far. Getting a goalkeeper who could distribute the ball effectively was key, as was bringing in centre-backs capable of covering ground quickly and allowing the team to play with a much higher defensive line. Goes back to the point I was just making. If you know what you demand off your goalkeeper, if you understand exactly what you want from your goalkeeper, it makes it easier to go out and find one that's the right fit. You know, we brought in Bern Leno, who was a good goalkeeper and is a good goalkeeper, and shouldn't be going anywhere for £8 million. Pounds. Let's be completely honest and transparent about that. But he was never a goalkeeper that you thought or, or was highly regarded for his ability to play with the ball at his feet. And clearly, for Mikel Arteta, that's a big thing. That's, that's a non-negotiable, as he would call it. That's something that he wants. That's something that he demands. And so that made it easier to go out and spot someone and find someone who could come in and be the right fit. And that's why we got Aaron Ramsdale. You know, Gabriel can give us the ability to play with a much higher line, as can Ben White, as we saw last season. And you're just slowly starting to see the pieces fitting in and the style becomes more clear and more apparent as that develops. And then the knock-on effect of that is that when it comes to recruitment, you now know exactly what you're in the market for. You can be clear in what it is that you want. And you can make sure that you don't just sign players for the sake of it. You don't sign players that you're not sure on. You don't sign players who could potentially clash with the style that you're trying to embed. So I think that's really, really important. As a knock-on effect of that clear style of play being defined now and being visible to everybody, reason number three is the recruitment has been far, far better. Arsenal spent some serious money in the past two summers, but more importantly, They've spent it well. There's been a much more holistic approach to recruitment, which, as Edu alluded to in a recent interview, involves identifying exactly how a player will fit into the side using data and in-depth analysis, getting to know the player, their agent and the family in order to minimise the risk of signing disruptive characters. There's also a consideration for a player's future sell-on value to try and avoid being stuck with dead wood, as we call it, a problem that's held the Gunners back for years. So using data to analyse what's wrong with your team, what is misfiring in your team, what particular areas are not functioning in the way that you'd like them to, then identifying what those things are and then going out and looking for players that tick those boxes. We heard that Edu sat down with Gabriel Jesus with a lot of data, with a lot of analysis already prepared and ready to highlight exactly to him how we could help this team, how we could take this team to the next level. And it's that kind of preparation that helps in the convincing of players, you know, that Arsenal is the right place for them. I mean, Unai Emery was very analytical. Let's not pretend he wasn't. He absolutely was. He We've heard time and time again about the hours and hours and hours of video footage that he used to show to the players, that he used to show to the team. But there was a disconnect at the club at that time. And, and Edu kind of saying that, well, the club didn't really know what he wanted and couldn't really grasp what it was he wanted now makes sense because they were bringing in players that didn't tick Unai Emery's boxes. And maybe Unai Emery didn't have the power to push back 
Um, maybe Unai Emery didn't have such a great relationship with the ownership. It did feel like that was a really kind of like, well, we've tried everyone and Unai Emery's the guy available now uh, type of signing, type of hiring. It, it wasn't one that anybody had on their list. It, he wasn't somebody that anybody was campaigning for. Um, it just came out of nowhere, didn't it? It just came out of the blue. So, yeah, I think that's that's really important. But the data bit, in terms of helping to identify players, I think is key. It shows that there's a plan. It shows that there's a lot of background work that goes into every single signing. The fact that they want to get to know his personality, his character, his family. Family can shape a person in a lot of ways. And I think that, again, they've added that element to their recruitment strategy that was maybe missing before. Clearly, personality wasn't something considered by the previous regime because we ended up with so many players who were just bad apples, rotten eggs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And it feels like we've done a lot of work to get those people out. And we're now trying to bring in people of a, of a certain character, of a winning mentality and, you know, happy days. Hopefully it bears fruit. Moving on to uh, reason number four, results are on the up. I talked about this right at the top of the episode. That's obvious that, you know, you finish eighth in successive seasons and then you finish fifth. Clearly things are on the up. Um, but I do say in this piece that there's a common misconception out there that Arsenal's improvement on the pitch began a month into last season. But the truth is the Gunners were much improved in the second half of the 2020 21 campaign too. The progress of the team has been steady now for over 18 months. And so this isn't just a flash in the pan. The consistency levels still aren't where they need to be. And at times, a lack of depth has cost them. But after back-to-back eighth-place finishes, coming fifth and narrowly missing out on Champions League qualification signifies, at the very least, movement in the right direction. This improvement, it wasn't just last season. It's been evident for a while now. Has it always been where it needs to be in terms of consistency and in terms of results? No, but we're getting closer to where we want to be and we're getting closer to where we need to be. And reason number five, and this one is is one of the most, I know this feels like a bit of a, oh, well, you know, he's just, um, this is the kind of PR crap that people wheel out when they want to make a case for Mikel Arteta and Edu and the job that they're doing. But reason number five for me, and perhaps for me as a fan, one of the most important ones is the connection with the fans is back. The connection with the fans is definitely back. I feel more invested, more connected with Arsenal than I have done maybe in the last decade. Genuinely. And and I'm not just making that up. Why? Because we've got players that have come through our academy, which is fantastic to see. Um, it's a really likeable group. I like the manager. I like the technical director. I like the direction we're going in. I like the approach that we've taken. I think it's the right approach given the circumstances, given the lay of the land. So I say in this piece that prior to last season, when visiting Emirates Stadium, there was a feeling that a touch of apathy had begun creeping into the fans' mindset, given the mediocre results and the subsequent struggle to see a way forward. I think as a football fan, the worst feeling you can have is apathy. If you're outraged and pissed off it's because you care it's because it hurts you to see your team struggling if you're happy then it's because your team is successful and if you're apathetic if you're kind of like well you know what I don't I don't really care about Arsenal anymore you know I'm not going to give up my weekends I'm not going to spend my time um watching Arsenal and if we win if we lose it doesn't really matter when you get to that point as a fan where it doesn't really matter that's the worst place you can be and, and I was, I'm not going to say I was in that place, but I was certainly getting closer and closer to it towards the back end of the Wenge years, the Unai Emery period as well. I was sort of slowly finding myself drifting towards that side of things and it was horrible. However, I say despite some noise on social media, which there always is following defeats, you only needed to spend one afternoon at the home of the Gunners last season to feel that connection between the fans and this young and exciting team building chance of we've got super Mick Arteta could be heard constantly. And despite the disappointing end to the campaign, for those in attendance, the support never waned. It never did. It never did. I was really lucky um, to be at, I think, every home game bar one last season. I think I missed Brighton because I had other work commitments. But other than that, I was at every home game. Um and particularly in the second half, I was at a lot of the away games, second half of the season, that is, I was at a lot of the away games as well. And the support for the team was just phenomenal. 
Now, that won't be there if people are outraged, disappointed, and feeling disconnected. People are feeling connected again. People are willing to give this a chance. People are willing to give this more time because of the likes of Bukayo Saka, Martinelli, Smith Rowe, Odegaard, Gabriel, Ben White, Ramsdale, Tommy Asu, Tier. Tierney when he's fit. You know, it's a really likable team and it's a team that a lot of us maybe aren't saying publicly yet, but feel like can go on and develop in unison and achieve really good things. You've got to be realistic about what those goals are, though, and what those objectives are. I mean, Manchester City, for me, are just ridiculously good. Uh, have had a ridiculous amount of investment over the years. And to think that Arsenal can compete with them, I think, is somewhat deluded based on where they are and based on where we're coming from. But the hope is, as an Arsenal fan, that we can close that gap. The hope is that we'll be ready when that dynasty, the Man City-Liverpool dynasty, starts to drop off, because it will, in the way that Arsenal-Manchester United's dominance faded away over time. There'll be a new kid on the block, there'll be a new kid in town, and hopefully that'll be us. But we've got a long way to go before we get there. So if you're sitting here going, well, we're not going to win the league next season, so what's the point in backing this project? Then you're just living on cloud cuckoo land. No football club in the world has a divine right to win anything. It's earned. And the clubs that have done it um, more, the clubs that have done it over sustained periods of time, well, you should look at that and give them a lot of praise because it's not easy to sustain this kind of level in a league like the Premier League. And I'm talking about Man City and Liverpool. It's not easy to sustain that level in the Premier League without that investment. I always use this example, but I'm going to use it again because I think it's a really good one. This is probably the best Liverpool team I've seen in my life. In fact, it is. You know, I know people talk about the great sides of the 80s. I wasn't around in the 80s. But the Liverpool side I see now under Jurgen Klopp is, is probably the best Liverpool side I've ever seen. But to put into context how difficult it is without being backed by a state, without being backed by owners like Manchester City's or Paris Saint-Germain's or Newcastle's in the event they decide to start really throwing money at the project. In order to compete with that, you have to be flawless. And Liverpool have been as close to flawless as is viably possible, really, but could end up by the time Jurgen Klopp leaves leaves the club with one Premier League title to their name. Just goes to show how strong City are. And so to think that we can break into that now, given that we've been run so badly for so many years and that we can't spend that kind of money. You know, people keep talking about Arsenal spending money. And I said in the piece, Arsenal spent a lot of money over the last two summers, but it's all relative because when you break down the average spend on the players we've signed, it's actually not that much. We've still not ever exceeded, with the exception of Nicolas Pepe. I'm talking, you know, with Arteta coming in, we've still not spent more than £50 million on a player. Look at Manchester City. Look at what they can afford to spend on a player. Jack Grealish came into the club last summer for £100 million. Chelsea spent £100 million pretty much on Romelu Lukaku last summer. 100 million pounds. Liverpool, because they've had a sustained period of success and been very good and generated lots of revenue, Champions League win, uh, cup competitions, etc. They were able to go and spend around about 75, whatever it was with add-ons on Darwin Nunez. We're still not at that point. And hopefully if we're successful and if we can maximise what we have available to us, we'll be able to get to that point where our squad the, the main uh, sort of build of it is is fine and is right. And we'll be able to allocate 75% of our summer budget on one or two signings that we really need, as opposed to still having to plug five, six positions every year as we continue to turn over the players and continue to turn over our playing staff because we've got so many bad apples, so many people that need to go, so many people on big wages that we can't give away for free at the moment. So I think when you take all of that into consideration, you think about the wider context of the entire thing, I think it's fair to say that Arteta and Edu have done a good job and we're moving in the right direction. I want Champions League qualification next season and if we don't achieve it, I'll be disappointed. No doubt about that in my mind. And we'll have to assess why that was and we'll have to break down the reasons and and then we can have a discussion around whether we're still moving forward. Arteta's the right man now. 
Is he the right man to finish the project, though? That still remains to be seen. And I think in order to be a successful football club, you always have to be open-minded like that. You can't be stuck in the mindset of, well, he got us to this point, so now we have to let him finish it. There will come a point, as with every football manager, where the cycle comes to an end, where they've hit their ceiling of what they can achieve with this football club, and you need to reconsider. And perhaps with all the foundations in place, with the strong recruitment that we've shown, Arsenal recruitment, not Arteta recruitment, not Eddie recruitment, Arsenal recruitment, players that come in and benefit what Arsenal are looking to build and create in the long term and will be sellable assets, etc., etc. Perhaps there will come a point where you'll look at it and go, so-and-so is a better manager. Let's get him in. And if we do, we can definitely go to that next level. But at the moment, we're still building and I think we're doing it in the right way. Be sure to leave a like on the video. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you're new. If you're listening to us via the audio platforms, please do leave us a review. It'll be very, very much appreciated. And I'll catch you all soon with some more Arsenal chat. I hope you've enjoyed this one. See ya. I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon.